Korea needs to be much better at utilizing the capacity of both men and women. So these are the two things that I have brought with me ever since the day in September 2011 when I first came, well I've been here many times before that, but when I first came here as an ambassador. And this has always been in the back of my mind. Should Korea have moral welfare? And how can Korea, basically, if you want to turn it that way, how can Korea be a more gender equal society in the sense that this country, how can this country be better at utilizing the intellectual capacity of both men and women? So these are, my, these are the things that I have occupied my thinking over the last four years. And of course, what I've all, also tried to do is to think, is there something that my own country can humbly offer as experiences in these two areas? Because we have a situation in Sweden where we supposedly have the most advanced welfare society maybe even in the world. At least it's the most expensive welfare society, I can tell you that. Uh, and we built that welfare society over a number of years. We also have a situation for example, on the labor market, that if you look at men and women between the ages of 20 to 64 years old, 79% of Swedish men in that age group are working, 79% of women are working. That does not mean that we are a perfect gender equal society, by no means. We also have our share of male chauvinism in our, my country, I'll tell you that. But still, looking at the economic fundamentals, there seems to be, we have seemed to be doing something relatively right when it comes to utilizing the capacity and the power of both men and women. Now, is this something Korea can learn from? Well, let me try briefly first to describe the cornerstones of the Swedish system. And after having done that, try to see and discuss with you whether these cornerstones and these experiences that we have are applicable to this great country. <clears throat> what are then the cornerstones in the Swedish system? First of all, we believe very strongly in social solidarity and social trust. If you want a developed welfare society with respect for human rights, you have to start with trust. Because without trust, without people trusting that government or others can use resources in a wise way, people will not be willing to pay the amount of taxes that are necessary in order to achieve a welfare society. How did we go about trying to create trust? Well, it actually in Sweden started on the labor market, which is a little bit unusual, because normally these kind of developments starts in the political life. But in our case, it started in the labor market in the 1930s. We've had historically a very strong trade unions in Sweden. But these trade unions early on decided that socialism or communism, whatever you want to call it, is not for us. Trade unions early on decided, we think that market economy is the best way to run a country's economy. We accept private companies, we accept profit. Now that was a very important starting point for the Swedish trade union movement, because that mean, meant that the employers, the owners of the factories and what have you, did not have to worry, and this is, we're not talking about the 1930s, where the times were quite different than they are now. They did not have to worry about a trade union or labor movement wanting to socialize them. It was a question of how can we make the market economy function better, and in the interest of a bigger group of people than just those who own the company. So in 1938, the Swedish employers and the Swedish trade unions, and you should remember, trade unions in Sweden organized about 80, 80% of all workers. 
white collar and blue collar workers. So it's a quite different situation compared to Korea, where it is about, what is it, 10% or something? Yeah. <clears throat> they agreed. They made what we call the grand bargain, saying, okay, workers said, we accept private companies, we accept private profit, but we would, would like to have a fair share of the profit, what that is. We don't want to take over the company, we want a fair share of the profit. And also, of course, a fair share of the losses, if that's the case. And we want to have an influence in how the companies are being run. And that the trust that was created with this agreement in 1938 is to a large extent still there. So today you would see Swedish trade unions, as all trade unions would do, asking for higher salaries when they have negotiations about collective bargaining agreements. Yes, of course. But not questioning the basics of the system, which is a market economy with private companies who make profit. Now this is a notion, this started the trust in the system. And this started the notion, which means that today, about 85% of all Swedes thinks that the system we have is basically a good one. Which means that in Sweden, you don't win elections by saying, I want to change the system. You win elections by saying, I can run the system better than the others. And that's a big difference. This trust, which is so essential, also means that over a period of time, Swedes have been willing to pay higher taxes than most other countries. Now, I have yet to meet very many people in this country who want to pay higher, pay, want to pay higher taxes. In Sweden, we have had a number of instances, the last one was actually last year, where political parties have won elections by promising higher taxes. How is that possible? Well, because they have been able to convince their electorates that we can use this tax money in a wise way. We can provide you with the services that you need in order to have a better life. So by doing that, it has been possible then to develop our system because we've had a surprisingly high level of willingness among people to pay tax. This distinguishes us from many other countries. Some people say all other countries. I'm not sure about that. But from many other countries. Now, how much tax do we pay? Well, income tax, everyone pays income tax. And everyone pays at least 30% in income tax, which is substantially higher than in Korea. Substantially higher. But on the other hand, I usually take myself as an example. If I pay my taxes in Sweden, since I'm technically still living in Sweden, even though I'm in Korea, which I'm, for which I'm very happy. But if I would pay my taxes with my income in Korea, I would pay more taxes in Korea than I do in Sweden. For my income. We have no wealth tax. We have no gift tax. We have no inheritance tax. We have no property tax. Tax haven, you say. Well, we pay 25% in VAT, which is considerably more, considerably more than you do. You pay 10%. We do not pay 25% on everything. On food, we pay 6%, which is less than you. But for most things that we buy in the stores, we pay 25%. Why is that? Well, because the tax system, what the conclusion that we have done is that in order for people to accept the tax system, it has to be transparent, it has to be easy, and it has to be rego regarded as relatively fair. Today, in Sweden, out of the taxes that the authorities assess, 98.5% is actually collected. In this country, I think it's around 70%, which is considerably lower. I guess this is one of the reasons why the president says that she wants, she says that she can increase the welfare without increasing the taxes, because she said she could be more efficient in collecting them. Well, good luck. But, but I mean, what we have done is to try to create a system 
where it's easy to pay tax. And VAT has this great advantage that it's very easy to collect. But in order for a VAT to be regarded as fair, you have to have a society where the difference between the richest and the poorest cannot be too big. Otherwise, the burden on the poorest will be too high. Which is probably why, for example, I never suggest that Korea should increase its VAT to 25%, because that would be a tremendous burden on the, the least fortunate in this country. But in our skid system, it works. It is perceived as fair. And it has, it's, a, it's also a very easy way to collect. But this system of having relatively high taxes are not possible, is not possible if you don't have the trust. Another reason why we have a high level of trust, trust is that we have very vigilant NGOs of various kinds. I mean, this is not, Sweden is not alone. This is, of course, something which we have in many democratic countries in the world. But our NGOs are particularly vigilant. They don't accept misuse of, of government funds. And they are very good at getting the media to write about these things if something goes wrong. And of course, things go wrong also in my country in many respects. But we have a very high level of transparency. If any of you come to Stockholm tomorrow, or maybe on Monday, because tomorrow is a holiday, <laughs> Monday, if you want to go into the Prime Minister's office, and read the mail of the Prime Minister, including his emails, you're free to do so. It's your right to do so. We have an extraordinary level of transparency. And this helps building trust. That is my point. In order to have this more elaborate welfare society, you have to start with the question, how do I build trust? And this, I think, is the question that many Koreans battle with. This society, which has grown so tremendously quick over the past decades, how can you match this tremendous growth with also an equally tremendous growth of the trust? The trust between people and government, between consumers and companies and so forth. And this is the key issue. This is the issue I think that you have to start with when you discuss the issue of welfare and human rights. How do we get there? Second important element in our system is that for Swedes, maybe, and here I think we are to some extent very similar to Koreans, for Swedes, it's necessary to work. We like work. We love work. We want to work as much as possible. Work is good. Work makes you, it, it enables you to fulfill your, your inner qualities. Of course we work to get some money so we can have some nice time. Yes, of course. But for us, work is even more than that. In this sense, I think Sweden and Korea are quite similar. Because I think also for you, I mean the prosperity, the tremendous wealth and prosperity of this country is in my mind, to a large extent, based on the fact that Koreans are very good at working. You're hard working. I hope you also like work. I think you like work. Maybe you work too much, but that's another story. Uh, but, but we are similar in the sense that we, we think that work in itself is something good. But, all, but also work is also important from another angle, from another aspect, which I just alluded to. If you have a very high percentage of the people that work, you will have more tax. You will more have tax income. So the whole system can only work because it requires a lot of income from the government. But if you have a lot of people working, you have a lot of people paying income tax, you have a lot of people consuming, paying VAT, and so on. So the whole system works, but it requires a high level of participation rate on the labor market. We estimate that if we get below 75% in average, then the system will not work. Then it will be too costly. I saw that the president here was saying that she aimed for a participation rate of 70%. Well, for Sweden, that would never be enough. We have 79, and we want to reach maybe even 84, 85. Because then the system work will work better. But it, it is, it's, it's based on the notion that 
people would like to work. Which means that in a system you have to have very, very strong incentives to enable people to work. And you also have to have discouragement for those money from heaven to you so they can live. So you need to balance this system which enables a number, which, which entails a number of benefits but they also, it is also necessary to remember that the system also requires obligations for each and every one of us. And the most, um, most important obligation is that everyone who can work should work. Some people cannot work for medical or other reasons, but everyone who can work should work. The next cornerstone in our system, and this may surprise you a little bit, is that Sweden is a very individualistic society. We believe very strongly in the individual. We love families, we love bigger groups, but the individual is always the cornerstone in a system. Because it is through the, if the individual can, so to say, make life good for him or herself. That's when you can have a good society. Yes, you need a framework also, but everything in our system is geared towards creating a situation where the individual can fulfill his or her dreams and aspirations. So, what, everything we've done in this construction of a welfare society has always had as a reference point. What does this mean for the individual? The first change that we did what that was very important was in 1971 when we went from family taxation to individual taxation. Before 1971, it was in Sweden like it is in most other countries that the income, I demand work. And society, you have to help out with childcare because that's normally the obstacle for, has traditionally been the obstacle for women to work. So, this whole concept of putting the individual in the center is very important. We also have a very strong social solidarity in our system, but you always remember it's focused on the individual. We did some other things which were heavily or fiercely discussed at the time, and that was a number of family law reforms. In the early 70s, we changed the family law and we took away the obligation for children to take care of their parents when they were getting old. I believe in Korea you still have that obligation. We don't. Does this mean that we don't love our parents? Does this mean that we don't take care of our parents? Of course not. But there is not the financial obligation to do it. Which means, of course, that the obligation to some extent is transferred to society. I take my own mother as an example. She unfortunately <coughs> passed away last year. But my mother lived, um, I am abroad, my, my brother and my sister also live in Sweden, but they don't live in the hometown where she lives. So when she was getting older, we were discussing, well, do any one of us have to move home and take care of her? Well, no, we didn't. Because what we then could request from the city where she lived was, at the start, to get people to come and help her, you know, with cleaning and cooking and those basic things that you may have a little bit difficult to doing when you get older. And that went on for three or four years, and then she became a little bit weaker. Well, then we could ask the government to provide her with a full-time daycare, a full-time elderly care home where she was taken care of 24-7 without any problem. We paid our taxes for it. She paid a fee for it, yes. She had been a teacher, so she had a good, rather good pension and she could pay for it. But basically, everyone should have the right for elderly care place regardless of income and you pay according to what you earn. So nobody should be forced to say no to go into an elderly care home because of money. What this means, of course, is that, first of all, she was well taken care of. Secondly, I could stay on the labor market. My wife could stay on the labor market. My brother could stay on the labor market. My sister could stay on the labor market. We could all continue to work. She was taken care of. 
we can work. We could still see her. We see, saw her a lot of times, but we did not have this legal financial obligation. Is this something that we could introduce in Korea? I'll leave to you to answer that question later on. Another important element, which has to do with studying, was that we introduced a system where children's studying did not, should not depend on the income of their parents. I mean, high school has always been tuition free in Sweden, just like it is for most Koreans as well. But what we also introduced at the time was tuition free university. If you do not pay tuition for studying at the university in Sweden, and moreover, you will get a study allowance and you can get a study loan for a very low interest also to make to survive while you're studying. Which means that I take myself again as an example. I have two children. One is still in university, the other one has completed university. I have not had to pay one single penny for their study. Not one single penny. Now, I can afford to pay if I wanted to, but that's okay. But the more important thing is that my neighbor, who may not be as wealthy or relatively affluent as I am, can also let his or her children study without having to worry for the cost. Once again, children should be regarded as individuals, as independent persons, who should not be dependent financially on their parents. They should still love their parents, yes, of course, and they do most of the time. But they should not have to be dependent. So the cornerstone in our system is that what we have done, I believe, is that we have modernized the concept of the family. Because you should remember, take once again this great organization of OECD that I referred to. OECD measures everything. I, I, I love statistics, and statistics are very important. OECD measures how much, in all the member states, how much time do parents spend with their children? Do you know which country where parents spend most time with their children? Sweden. <laughs> so we still love families. I mean, that's not the issue. But the family should not be, family in our mind should be an institution where two people live together, hopefully love each other, but they should not be financially dependent on each other. They should be individuals. And of course, to, in order to be able to have such a, such a situation, well, you have to be able to work. You have to have a system which enables people to work, and so on and so on. So, this individualization is a very important cornerstone in our welfare system. We have also tried to be very, because a lot of this, the, the, our system to a large extent rests on the provision of certain kind of services. Daycare for children, elderly care, schools, hospitals, what have you. Well, what, the same things that you have here. What we have tried to do in order to make the system as efficient as possible is to be very open-minded when it comes to how these services should be offered. So for example, preschools, kindergartens in Sweden, would be about half of them would be public, half of them would be private. But nobody should have to pay more than the equivalence of 150,000 Korean won per month for full-time daycare for a child. So private preschools cannot charge more than public. Because private preschools, as well as public preschools, will get a certain amount of money from the government to offer these services. And by being this flexible and using, let's call it market mechanisms, to offer these public services, this has, in many respects, helped us to be more efficient and to have a greater variety of various services that the citizens can choose, choose between, which in the long run, I think, has been quite good. The fourth cornerstone is that we're trying, we have tried to form and work for what we call an inclusive society. 
Swedes are, I think, more egalitarian minded than most other people. We also have people who are very rich. It's good, to, you know, it's no problem to be rich. The founder of IKEA, the furniture maker, you know, who now opened their first store here in Korea, Ingmar Kampro, he's one of the richest men in the world. And he lives in Sweden, he pays taxes. The owner of H&M, the clothing store, which I think you can find also here, even in Guangzhou, is also an individual, very, very rich. You can be very, very rich in Sweden, and that's okay. But, the diff we, our conclusion, and this is not something which just is a notion of the leftists in our, in our country, but for most of society, the notion is that a society becomes stronger and better if you do not have too big difference between the rich and the you know, this is measured by, as you know, by, by international institutions with the so-called Gini coefficient. And Sweden has one of the best Gini coefficients in the world. Once again, you can be very rich in Sweden, and that's no problem. And people admire people, other people become rich. But in general, the difference between the richest and the poorest is smaller, is, is less than in most other countries. Another important notion in this inclusive society is that we have tried to change the way people look at welfare. Myself, I don't, I'm a little bit hesitant when it comes to the term, concept of welfare, because it doesn't really say what it's all about. For most people, welfare is something the rich give to the poor. Welfare is something if you don't have, you will receive. Well, in Sweden, we have tried to change the notion of welfare by saying the following. Yes, when it comes to taxes and when it comes to welfare, there is always an element of transferring from the riches to the poor. Yes. But the most important aspect of a welfare system is that it helps the individual, every individual, to balance his or her situation through their life cycle. I'm a relatively speaking high income earner, but I also benefit from the welfare system. I also get subsidized daycare for my children when they were small. I also get free tuition for my children when they go to university. So when, 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 when you have children in the early stages, every family gets something from the system. Then you have a period between what, 25 and 60 where you sort of give back to the system by paying taxes. But then hopefully when you get older again, well then you receive from the system again. Now this is very important, because if you have, can create an understanding in society that welfare is basically something which anyone can benefit from, then you have a much higher acceptance of the system. Because everyone, get, everyone is young, and hopefully everyone gets old, and you have different periods of life when you have different needs. And this, I think, is something where I see one of the bigger differences between Sweden and Korea is that very few people in Korea see welfare this way. Most people here will see welfare, you know, taking taxes and then throwing it away to someone else. But welfare is for everyone. And that's a very, has been a very, very important element in our, the development of our system. How has this been possible? Well, I come back to the issue of trust. Sweden, of course, in many ways, have been, has had a very fortunate situation. We have not been in war for 200 years. We are a country which has abundant, an abundance of natural resources, forests, iron ore, hydropower, you may, I wouldn't say you name it, we got it, but, but basically where someone has given us a lot of things that we can use and make things of, which is, of course is, is quite amazing. On the other hand, we have this cold climate, which is too hard. So in that sense, we're, we're, uh, one can say that we are, uh, we are very, very fortunate. But we also have one more thing, and that is, that, and that start, and that's, I, I refer to what I started with. How did trust start? I said trust started on the labor market. Well, what we managed to achieve now is also a comparatively high level of trust in the political system. I said earlier, you cannot win elections in Sweden by changing the system. What this also means is that most politicians in Sweden, not all, but most, a great majority, 
will understand the following. Yes, there should always be ideological differences in politics, because that's called democracy. You should have different viewpoints, and the one who can gather the most support for their viewpoints should have the authority. Yes, that's fine. But there are a number of issues in any developed society which require consensus, which require agreement across party lines. And we have been fortunate enough to have politicians who have understood that there are certain issues where you should throw differences of opinion and politics aside and try to agree on substance. For example, we changed some time ago our pension system. We had a situation a little bit similar to Korea where we had an underfunded pension system, not only for, for public employees but for the whole system. And it was possible, it was possible for five of the seven parties in the parliament from both sides of the aisle, so to say, to agree on a new pension system which makes our pension system directly dependent on the economic growth of the country, meaning that the system is sustainable. It, may, it means, for example, <coughs> that during the Lehman Brothers crisis, 2008-9, pensions went down. And of course, people say, oh, what is this? You know, what, what's happening? Well, then politicians from both sides were able to take responsibility, and they were able to tell, look, this is what you have to get used to. The level of pensions will depend partly on your contributions, but mostly on the general economic development. If there is growth in society, if a lot of people work, yes, that also means higher pensions. But if there is not, well, then it could mean for a few years that pensions will go down. People didn't like it. My mother-in-law, 97 years old, she was very unhappy, but she's managing anyway, so that's it. And she's managing because of Ginseng candy. That's another story. But anyway, this is very important, that if you have issues like this in every society, have issues, has issues, where you actually need long-term solutions which are sustainable also over the next election. Pension is, I think, the most typical example of those kind of questions, but there may be others. How do you devise in general terms your educational system? What kind of security policy should a country have? And so on. There are a few, I think, of these issues where actually a good society, which respects welfare and which respects human rights in the general sense, should try to find agreement in the world. And we have roughly been able to do that on most of these issues. So these are some of the cornerstones that we have built on trying to create a society which once again is still full of challenges, still full of problems. I will speak very briefly about some of them shortly. But basically, we have created something which most people think, pretty okay, yeah, in spite of the cold weather, yeah, Sweden, we can live there, it's okay. <laughs> and we have the, one of the highest birth rates among all developed countries, 1.95. In, to me, this is the best evidence if people believe in your society. That is if you choose to give birth to children. Because that means that you have a basic trust in how society develops. And it seems like we've, we've done that so far. Now, isn't there, aren't there any problems? Do you live in the land of milk and honey when everyone is happy and everything is fine? Of course not. Maybe it's sort of uh, logical for an ambassador to try to focus on the positive aspects of one's own country, but there are also a number of challenges, of course. There is always, because if you have this welfare system, there is always a risk that some people misuse it. That, that's always there. So what we have, and, but one very important element for us has been that we have to constantly reform our system. We should never try to fool ourselves and say, okay, now we're ready, now we've completed the perfect building here, everything is fine, just let, let's just be, keep it like this and go on. Never, never, never. Any system, any complex society, any complex welfare system has to constantly be reformed. All the time questioned, all the time criticized, all the time discussed. 
And this has been one element that we have been, I think, rather good at. Constantly questioning this. Constantly trying also to make it even better. And we have, what, one thing that we have tried to change is to make the incentives to work as strong as possible, which also means, of course, that the disincentives not to work, unless you have medical reasons, they have to be very strong. Otherwise, it don't work. Because it rests on the willingness of a high degree, high number of people, the willingness they have to pay taxes. Without that, no cost. Okay, can Korea copy this? Should Korea copy this? Well, I can answer the last question. No, you should not copy this, of course. Are there elements in this that could be useful for Korea? Well, now I should be very humble, of course, because it's not my role to try to say Korea should, should do this and this and this, but not that, that and that. That would be very presumptuous of me. But since I'm a presumptuous person, I will do it anyway. <laughs> uh, to me, after four years, which is a very short time, I think there are some elements that are necessary for this society to continue to develop in the way that it has so far. I would say that the most important one is probably to make it better, easier and more possible for women to contribute to the future growth of this country. Korea is the best educated country in the world. You should be very proud of that. I know it also creates problems. Yes, education fever and too much study. Yes, of yes. But you have the best educated population in the world. But you also have a situation where the majority of those who graduate from universities are women. They're not men. I'm sorry, my fellow men. But Korean <laughs> women are probably, just as Swedish women, a bit smarter than men. At least when it comes to graduation from university. Now that's smart or not smart, that's not the point, because we know that we are good at different things. And any good society needs to build on the capacity of both men and women. Otherwise, you will not have growth. It's a question of justice, yes, but it's also a question of growth. And I would like to ask anyone, is anyone against future growth in Korea? Of course not. I mean, we all know that in order for this great society to continue even further, we need growth, at least some sort of growth. And in order to have that in a more complex society, with more of service provisions and things like that, we need to fully utilize the capacity of both men and women. And here we know that there are still some things to do in this country. A lot of it has to do with things that I talked about. The need to provide reasonable cost daycare for children. A lot of it has to do with provision of elderly care. But a lot of it also has to do with the mindset. We need to change our thinking. We all do. And maybe Korean men also need to change their thinking a little bit. To accept the situation where in a modern, prosperous, growing, vibrant Korea, men and women are sharing more equal both responsibilities to work, but also the responsibilities at home. This has been, I think, the key in Sweden, is that Swedish men have understood that it's good also to take responsibility for your children. The most important change that we've seen on Swedish workplaces is that today it is regarded as perfectly natural if a man takes paternity leave for three months, six months, nine months. It's not regarded as something where the employer will punish you, on the contrary, it's seen as a normal responsibility which growth will be low. And that's what it's about. Lastly, I also think, and this is a big subject, which is probably a subject for next lecture, which I will come back to in one year's time or something. I don't know. <laughs> you have to come back. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> don't say too much. <laughs> uh, I think that. It, this is also an important issue in Korea, which I don't see being discussed too much, is how do you run your country? Korea has a tradition where most of the sun comes from Seoul, so to say. I mean, most of the power comes from the central government. 
And this is not unusual. I mean, we have many countries in Europe which are very similar. France is, is in my case, the, the most important case in point, where Paris has always been a very strong center. We have seen, in Sweden, that a very important element in trying to form the society that I have tried to describe is to try to have a somewhat stronger and more powerful local government. Now, in Europe, we talk a lot about what we call the principle of subsidiarity. That is that the decision-making power should be, you should try to take decisions in society on the lowest possible level. Because then the, the, the decisions are taken closer to people. In Sweden, local government can assess income tax. A Swedish city controls about 85% of its own income. The rest comes tra transfers from central government. But a very, very large share is something which the, the local government controls itself. It assesses taxes on its citizens, and it can at e and, and the government can the local government can be elected or dismissed in, in local elections, just as, as we have the case here. I hear a lot of talk about the need for constitutional discussions in Korea, and that's of course quite natural because we're still a rather young democracy. But these discussions mostly focus on issues like should the president be able to be re-elected for two terms, and you know, how is the relation between the president and the parliament and so on. Those are of course very important issues. What I would hope that you could start to discuss also is the balance of power between the center and the local government the best. Or is there a need to change? I'm not sort of trying to instill some revolution here, but I think it is very important to have a constitutional discussion also on this. Because it is on the local level that you provide the services to the citizens. All those things that I have described here as part of our system, which are very important to enable every citizen to exercise his or her human rights, they are to a large extent provided on the local level. Now, is it reasonable that the most of the income for the city of Guangzhou is a form in the form of transfers from Seoul? Well, maybe it is, but I think it should at least be discussed. And it should be discussed thoroughly. Ladies and gentlemen, the problem to invite this ambassador to speak is that he never stops. <laughs> <laughs> he never finishes on time, which I, of course, haven't done this time either. That's my perennial problem. But that's, that's just the risk that you have to take. I have tried not to preach, because that, I'm not in the business of preaching. I let others do it. What I've tried to do is to describe to you something which has helped our country, my country, to create a society where a large part of its population believe that it's, it, can combine, it's, it can combine its individual rights its human rights, its right to express itself, its right to have a decent life, with also a joint responsibility for something which we can call the welfare society. Once again, we still have many challenges, many problems, but my belief is that there can be elements in this that may also be useful for Korea. Because you are a society which still is very much in development. And you have this wonderful habit of not being afraid for changes, of changes. You're not afraid of the future. And when you decide to change, you do it much quicker than anyone else. So the future is yours. We may be the past, I don't know, but we're in that case a rather good past. So you have every chance, particularly you who are young here. We have every chance to help form this great society into an even greater one. And you do it, I think, by remembering, and that's my last point, everything that I talked about is a result of the fact that individuals in my own country thought that it was necessary to advocate change and improvement. If you want to achieve something, in the final end, it always comes down to yourself. Okay, I cannot change the world myself. I cannot even change Sweden myself. I can't even change my family myself. That's not my way. But still, you can do things to your own your own if you really work hard and if you really get engaged. 
So whatever you want Korea to be in the future, to some extent, it is up to you. Because you can influence it. You may sometimes feel that, oh, no, I can't do it. It's too big. It's someone else who decides. Well, you cannot do it, change it immediately. But what you can do, each and every one of you, is to contribute to change. And if you want to contribute to change, change with you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.